Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another epidose of the Ketogenic Fasting Project. Tonight, I'm talking about autism, the ever controversial topic of what causes autism and why is autism different for just about every individual. A deep and intriguing question, and one that people are very, very passionate about. So passionate that the conversation is typically split right down the middle between people who think it's caused by vaccine and people who think it's not caused by vaccines. The vaxxers, the anti-vaxxers, blah, blah, blah. I think most people are aware of this controversy. But I really personally want to uh, change the discussion. I don't think that is a fruitful discussion. I don't think it's going to help anybody. And uh, my mission is really about the quality of life for people, both on and off the spectrum. Naturally, I believe that diet plays a very important role. Things like exercise come second. And uh, I wanted to make the point that while other people are arguing about exactly what causes autism, there are things we can do about it. I'm sure I've mentioned it before. If, if you've seen the, the movie or the documentary, The Magic Pill, you'll see that a couple of autistic children in there had a great deal of benefit from a ketogenic diet. But of course, I'm familiar with a number of autistic people who have uh, not only been on ketogenic diets, but also carnivorous diets and benefited greatly. So that's really what this video is about. I'll discuss what I think the cause of autism is and how relevant I think it is. I don't believe I actually know. I don't think anybody knows per se, but... Let's try and talk about a little bit of science. So I got some slides here. Hopefully they're not too terribly boring for you. So any of these uh, studies that I mentioned for many of these slides, you can look up yourself. If you just simply typed in this title right here, saturated fat is not the major issue. This is in the BMJ. Uh, you should be able to find this study and read it for yourself. Uh, I talk about studies a lot. If you join our group, uh, Autistic Carnivores, we frequently discuss studies at length. People post more studies, we bat them back and forth. Uh, you'll find all kinds of people in there with all kinds of perspectives on them. Sometimes they're mouse studies, sometimes they're human studies. They could be done on dogs. You never know. Well, you don't when you read them. But anyways, I brought this up uh, as a parallel. Uh, this, this particular one, saturated fat is not the major issue. I brought it up to, uh, to draw a parallel between this and the saturated fat scare that more or less started with Ansel Keys. I mean, there were opponents to eating animal meat before that, but Ansel Keys is really the one who kind of pushed this concept that Saturated fat and cholesterol are bad for you. And of course, you still hear people today pushing that same beleaguered concept when they don't really discuss, you know, why exactly the glycocalyx is compromised and then how these particles plant themselves inside the endothelial cells and then remain there and stay there. And I, I'm convinced, and a lot of people are convinced, that it really has to do with it. Uh, chronic inflammation and oxidized LDL and stuff like that. So in the same way that a lot of people feel that autism is caused by things like vaccines or pollution or whatever, I don't really believe that is the case. And I'm going to demonstrate why. And I'm going to sh show studies on a number of influential factors. This one uh, kind of uh, is part of the parallel. This, is, this particular study is the International Journal of uh, Preventive Medicine, 
a, a contemporary review of a relationship between red meat and the con, uh, consumption and, and cardiovascular disease. So uh, this is a study from 2017. If you read this um, and a number of other studies, you can get a better idea of what the modern picture is and not the picture that people like Ansel Keys or even the detractors of William Banting all the way back in the 1800s were saying. Uh, we kind of live in an environment where disease is kind of looked at as generally as something that's cured by drugs. This here article, America's Top Selling Drugs, was in Psychology Today, and it talks about, um, the, obviously, the top selling drugs. And uh, this kind of notion that if you have some sort of illness, you're supposed to take some sort of medication for it, where I think that diet is actually the cause of most disease. And while diet in particular may or may not cause autism in an individual, it can have a profound effect on the symptoms. This is uh, the journal Research in Medicine, Environmental Factors Influencing the Risk of Autism. Uh, environmental factors have long been sus suspected. There are a number of chemicals that have uh, been linked to the increase um, the increase in autism in children. And presumably in that model, the mother is exposed to these chemicals. And the prevailing models tend to show that autism begins in the womb. And the question is then is why, why do so many children seem to present autism after being vaccinated or uh, coming down with some sort of infection? And to me, the 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 obvious answer is that they they were already autistic they may have been had a mild form of autism that wasn't a, a, a parent and then when they were vaccinated the uh, immune activation triggered symptoms that are common to autistic people that then presented itself and caused things like seizures regression loss of vocabulary, insatiable crying, digestive issues, and so on and so forth, the, the typical fanfare. So that, in a nutshell, is what I'm talking about. Now, these other uh, studies will point out things that are also related. This one here, now, I should explain. When I make my videos, um, I don't make them just for people who could see, I try and make them for people uh, with all sorts of disabilities. So I'm trying to be mindful of that. So I'm gonna explain what's on the screen a little more in the future to help people out who, who can't see very well or can't read very well. Like myself, I'm, I'm dyslexic and that's why I work primarily in the video uh, medium. I'm uh, thinking about uh, adding the audio to some of the podcast outlets. Um, I don't see, see why I shouldn't, but you know, my, my goal was to try and help as many people as possible. So, but, uh, this is an article, um, entitled, uh, biochemical aspects and autism spectrum disorders, updating the opioid excess theory and presenting a new opportunity for biochemical intervention. I really just put this study in here um, as to make the point that there has been a number of theories that sort of attribute autism to um, many different factors, right? So some of them less known. This next one here, uh, you can look up on PubMed. It's biochemical aspects and autism spectrum disorder, updating the opiate access, uh, opiate excess theory, presenting new opportunities for, for bio, biochemical intervention. This is by Shatok in uh, 2002. This is related to the last one, but it's at a different source. So if you want to read it, uh, I encourage people to read all of these. And at the end, I'm going to cover some books three different books with three different perspectives and I suggest people 
read all three of them because we're kind of at that point where a lot of people have really hard feelings about things. People have really strong opinions about autism or vaccines or vaccination. And typically they don't really understand them. They've seen a little bit of evidence, but they don't understand it with any depth. So I encourage people to read these articles, studies, and books, and then join the conversation. If you want to join a rational conversation where people aren't taking a firm stance pro or uh, for vaccines or against the vaccines, come join us at Autistic Carnivores and let's talk about it. Um, you're, you're more than welcome to present your studies there and we'll discuss them in a, in a uh, peaceful and uh, hopefully enlightening manner. So this next one is at uh, Disability Scoop and it's autism mostly caused by genetic study finds. This is really an article about a study, but uh, I think it's pretty clear that the, the genesis of autism is heavily related to genetics and there's a few possible ways but a lot of people don't understand that genetics really has multiple layers so there's, there's the set of genes that are encoded in our DNA and then after that we can look at epigenetics and the epigenetics is really whether those genes are turned on or turned off or mediated or reduced genes really are instructions for producing proteins and those instructions could be put on hold, they can be turned off, and so on and so forth. And a lot of that has to do with influence from the environment and experience, but not just of you, but of your parents and your grandparents and your great-grandparents, and, um, and, and also your immediate environment. So it's a very complicated discussion. This article here is in Science News, and it's called Diagnosed Autism Link to Maternal Grandmother Smoking in Pregnancy. Well, this is, this is kind of in here just to show how far out these strange sort of associations can go. And of course, these associations really aren't any sort of proof, but it could be some sort of epigenetic trigger. We don't really know. I'll admit it's, it sounds far-fetched, but this type of evidence might really just be part of a bigger puzzle. And it may not, you know, autism in general may not be caused by your grandmother smoking, but it might be, it might be a sign pointing at a mechanism that's actually useful. This one here is a YouTube video for you video fans out there. Like I said, I'm dyslexic. I watch a lot of videos because I get to hear people talk about stuff. There's not a lot of, you know, you can get through a presentation without a lot of intensive reading. Um, and this one is by, I'm gonna, he's got a tough name. I'm just going to say that. It's Laurent Adamowix. It's L-A-U-R-E-N-T is his first name. And apparently his last name is A-D-A-M-O-W-I-C-Z. This is on YouTube. It is a TEDx Youth at Beacon Street presentation, and it's called Secondary Sugar Kills. Now, this one is more or less about all the extra sugar that was put into food, and towards the beginning, he talks about baby formula. I didn't put any of the studies on baby formula in there, but uh, there's a couple of them, I believe, posted at uh, carnivoreinfo.com. They're probably somewhere in the threads on uh, autistic carnivores and probably the ketogenic fasting project on Facebook. And uh, if I remember, I will post uh, some more studies in the show notes for this video. But, uh, you know, baby formula has become popular for a number of reasons. But uh, a lot of times baby formula is made from things like soy and they add a ton of sugar to it. Soy is not a natural food for human beings and elevating sugar levels is a problem, not just for infants, but also f for adults, young adults. This one here is uh, an article. Um, sorry, I don't have the publication in front of me, but it's, it's titled... Maternal HbA1c influences autism risk in offspring. 
Now, this study was done. They measured the HbA1c in uh, expecting mothers or mothers who are delivering, and they noticed a very, uh, uh, let's see, children born to women with HbA1c of at least 6.5% were nearly twice as likely to receive a diagnosis of autism in the first four years of life. Now, uh, um, for people who aren't familiar with uh, A1C levels, A1C levels is is sort of a, a test where they look at how glycated blood cells are, and glycation is a process uh, where proteins are exposed to sugar in the blood. The sugar damages the protein, so this test kind of measures that. It gives you kind of uh, an idea of how much exposure there was over the life of those blood cells, which is usually estimated to be about three months. They may may sound complicated, but it it, it kind of is is painting a picture of the, your past blood sugar levels. And here they found a profound correlation between uh, A1C levels or HB1C or hemoglobin A1C levels and uh, and a diagnosed for autism. So at 6.5%, it doubled. A normal or considered a normal level is 5.7%. So it's uh, an increase of less than 1%, which is kind of shocking. An increase of less than 1% glycation uh, uh, correlated to a uh, an outcome of more than doubling in autism. So that's kind of scary. And that kind of goes back to the previous one uh, the video where they're talking about sugar levels in um, baby formula. Sorry, double clicked on that one. Now this next one here, another sort of sugar related uh, study. This one uh, I punched up on PubMed and it says maternal fructose consumption disrupts brain development of offspring in a murine model of autism spectrum disorder. Now, as my uh, my online pal Bart K pointed out, this is a mouse study. This is not like the last one where it was done on human beings. Uh, Bart Bart's uh, got some pretty uh, sound um, sound uh, reasons for being very skeptical of mouse studies, and I I, I back him on that. But uh, starting with a mouse study is a good good place to look when you want to go back. Uh, and uh, design a new study to to um, replicate on humans, right? So, because uh, studying mice obviously is a lot easier and less expensive than studying human beings. So, if you kind of start with that, but again, we're talking about fructose. We're talking, which is a sugar. It's a sugar typically found in fruit. It's also put into soft drinks and candies and stuff like that. And it's my personal belief that fructose is pretty dangerous sugar. I know uh, a lot of people are, are already angry about me saying that, but really in, through the evolution of uh, human beings, fruit was only available at certain times a year, you know, typically towards the end of summer for a short period of time. So I don't think the human body was really designed to ingest much fructose. Um, and nowadays, not only do people get to eat fruit year round, but they put uh, high fructose corn syrup and all kinds of stuff. So uh, it's just one of the problems with sugar. This is one more problem in plant based foods. This uh, study right here autism spectrum disorder in the gut microbiota. Um, you know, Gut biome is a is a topic of discussion um, that's very popular these days. This is actually a study from 2019. Um, I'm kind of in that camp where I don't think we understand the gut biome. Gut biome is is you know comes up a lot, but I think one of the things to point out is that it's not well understood. In that every time people change their diet or they take antibiotics or whatever the gut biome is going to change and uh, doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be unhealthy there doesn't seem to be one sort of combination 
of microbes in the upper or the lower intestine that make people healthy. Uh, I think that's a mistake I see with a lot of people is like, oh, you got to eat this or that. So you have plenty of this or that, you know, and I, I don't really think that's the case. I don't think there's enough evidence to support that, that line of thinking. Um, and I think uh, like a lot of, a lot of, a lot of uh, these other sort of um, po- supposed causes or possible causes of autism that we may find that a different sort of gut biome is actually a symptom of autism or a symptom of what causes autism as opposed to the actual cause of autism. So I thought it was good to throw that in there because this is another potential uh, potential bone of contention. I'm not saying there's no way this could be the cause. It's possible. But uh, I think it's probably more likely on that list of potential uh, side effects or outcomes from whatever caused the autism. I double-clicked on that one. All right, so this next one is uh, risk factors for unhealthy weight gain and obesity among children with autism spectrum disorder. Um, This one, again, I looked up on PubMed. This is a study from uh, 2019. I'd just like to point out that uh, this this ties, could tie in nicely with gut biome. And it also could be that gut biome is different and weight is different because the diet is just wrong. Imagine, you know, like I said, that eating a different diet will change your biome, your gut biome. And as, as people under, uh, we understand things better and better and more things are studied. You, you've got to realize that the, the digestive tract and different sections of the digestive tract have very different biomes. The brain has its own biome. The brain was originally, sort of discusses though it was sterile and now we know that there's a, a whole different range of of uh microorganisms that live in different parts of the brain that need to be in balance but they're not necessarily going to be be identical in every healthy person and this is true throughout the body this is true on your skin this is true under your fingernails and your hair and so and so on now, this is a very, very popular topic uh, in autism right now. Um, it's the topic of oxalate. Oxalates are a uh, uh, chemical that's found in the human body. It's made by the human body, but it's also present in a number of foods. Uh, there's certain foods that are very high in oxalates. And one of the problems with autistic people is they commonly don't eliminate oxalates or oxalic acid very well. And again, I'm not in that camp that thinks that oxalates cause autism. I think that it's very common for autistic people to have a problem with eliminating oxalates from their body so they accumulate. If you go online and you look, you'll find out that oxalates accumulate all over the body. Uh, they can accumulate in your heart muscle. Well, the heart is made out of muscle, basically. And uh, in the wall of the heart, you can get these large deposits. And the pictures are pretty frightening. People get deposits in their brains. And uh, so oxalates are something uh, that people ought to know whether their body has is, is got an excessive amount or not because they, they can actually be very, very dangerous and you're going to get uh, a lot of oxalates from things like almonds and spinach and stuff like that. So if you're in one of those people that has an, an excessive accumulation of something like this, then you probably want to uh, know that. So I'm, I'm a big fan of testing whatever you can and just getting a good picture because what if foods with a lot of oxalates or even maybe a cleaner like I haven't actually found a container and read it, but there's a cleaner called uh, Bark Barkeeper's Friend, and that is supposedly the primary ingredient in that is oxy- oxalic acid, which is oxalates. So um, here's another one. This one is uh, uh, update on oxalate crystal disease. 
this uh see where was this one I'm trying to see it's h h s public access um off the top of my head, I forgot exactly what this one said, how it tied in. But if uh, oxalates have been on your mind, I know I, I talked to uh, Susan Owen a couple of months ago. I talked about uh, interviewing her in the video, and uh, she wanted me to do some homework and, and brush up on this topic. Um, Elliot Overton had done a video about oxalates. A couple other people have talked about them. So I'm still doing my homework on this. I'm kind of, I do want to tread the same ground as everybody else, but um, uh, it's, I think it's, I think it's talked about a lot in autistic circles is because there's so many people with autism that have trouble eliminating from their body. But I include in this video because I, so far I don't see that it's necessarily a cause of autism. It's more a side effect or symptom. Sorry, I skipped past that. Uh, this is another article related to oxalates. This one is, says, primary and secondary hyperoxaluremia, understanding the enigma. So this is just another article. This is from uh, World Journal of Nephrology. Uh, I believe the whole article, <clears throat> I, not all of these articles are completely public. Uh, sometimes you have to pay in order to read the whole thing, but you could usually at least read the abstract uh, most of them are available on journals like this or PubMed or was it uh, the the one that's the uh, science uh, public science library one. I, sorry, I forgot. It'll probably come up though later. So anyways, if you just look these up online, you can read them for yourself. I'm always looking to discuss the, the ins and outs of these things with other people. So I encourage other people to, to read these things and get a better understanding. This one here was at Natural Health 365. New research links excessive oxalates to breast cancer. So again, you know, this is a little outside of the autism, um, the autism discussion itself, but it, it kind of points to the fact that a number of these health problems could very well be related to diet. And the one person who might suffer from one disease might uh, might find somebody who's um, got the same problem, like an oxalate accumulation. One person might get cancer. Another person might get another disease, like heart disease, or have some some sort of brain dysfunction, or that might irritate their uh, intensify their autistic symptoms. This is another one. Uh, we probably all know somebody who's had uh, kidney stones. Something like 80% of kidney stones are caused by oxalates. They're calcium oxalate uh, kidney stones. So people who can't naturally eliminate enough oxalate will get kidney stones. And I think a lot of people I know, I, I think I was under the impression that most uh, kidney stones are caused by, you know, drinking too much milk or something like that. But it's actually the oxalates and it's the calcium binding with the oxalates to sort of protect the kidney that um, when, it, when it can't be eliminated from the kidney, then the, the kidney gets these kidney stones. Of course, if you know anybody's passed a kidney stone, they're very painful. So keep in mind, that not only do autistic people suffer from a worsening of symptoms potentially, but also people get common problems like kidney stones and someone might, you know, it might even cause breast cancer. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to tell you what journal that was. That, uh, the title of this article was Oxalate Metabolism in Renal Stone Disease with Special Reference to Calcium Metabolism and Intestinal Absorption. And I don't, sorry, I didn't put the journal in here. I'm going to try and put as many of the links to these studies as possible in the show notes. And they should also be somewhere on carnivoreinfo.com. Quite a few of them are going to be listed at Autistic Carnivores on Facebook and so on and so forth. But you should be able to find them just by searching the title. 
And this one is another article. It's a potential uh, pathogenic role of oxalates in autism. And uh, again, you know, this kind of points to the thing. I think a lot of people were kind of thinking that maybe oxalates were a cause of autism, but actually most of these uh, studies don't really say that. And I know uh, quite frequently when I post articles like these or studies like these and autistic groups that aren't really focused on nutrition, a lot of people do have a knee-jerk reaction and they immediately think that I'm posting an article because me and whoever wrote the article or the designed the study believe that this particular thing caused autism. But they don't, you know, I, so you get this immediate sort of criticism before they ever read the article. And naturally, most of these articles aren't saying that, you know, autism is caused by oxalates or autism is caused by mercury or whatever. They're just studying oxalates and mercury in people with autism. So in this case, this article, so on, uh, I punched up on PubMed, and it says autism spectrum disorder and mercury toxicity use of genomic and epigenetic methods to solve the etiological puzzle. So I'm sorry, etiologic puzzle. So again, uh, mercury, uh, you know, b being tied to things like thimerosal and vaccines. Um, I don't necessarily think that uh, mercury is probably the cause of autism, nor do I think the vaccines or the thimerosal cause the autism. Again, I think that uh, one, autistic people frequently have a problem eliminating toxins like mercury from their body, just like oxalates. And so they tend to accumulate more of it, but I think that is a side effect or uh, a uh, symptom of autism or a symptom of the similar genetics that a lot of autistic people have rather than the actual cause of autism. And of course, it could very well make their symptoms worse. So I don't, you know, that's kind of where I would like like people to be able to discuss these things without breaking down into the tribal warfare over vaccines. Um, in my, I'm in case you didn't know this, um, I'm a full-time carnivore and, uh, I'd like to be sensitive to the idea that, um, a lot of people out there think eating meat is unhealthy, eating meat's bad for the planet and so on and so forth. I believe otherwise, uh, one of my online friends had posted this in autistic carnivores, and this is a, I've pointed out some of the other, uh, similar sort of websites or concepts or people, but, um, ruminants are supposed to be roaming around on the prairies and the rangelands and stuff like that. And that is really what makes for a sustainable planet. Um, of course, you know, a lot of people don't like the idea of factory farming. They think cows are crowded into feedlots and stuff like that. And I don't know anybody wants to see animals that suffer are suffering and tortured or whatever. But uh, even uh, factory farm cows spend 80% of their life just eating grass. Um, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, cows, that, beef that winds up the supermarket are fed grain at the end and stuff like that. But uh, cows are herd animals, you know, and they wander around on the grass and eat uh, the prairie just like at the feedlots they gather and feed together. Um, you know, so it's not necessarily horrible. They're not necessarily tortured. And I believe that uh, things like cows and sheep and goats and stuff like that and pigs, they're our natural food. We've been eating uh, a high meat diet for at least 2 million years. The earliest uh, butchered fossils are 2.7 million years old. And I believe that uh, human beings not only were originally scavengers that eat, ate the meat that was left over by, by other predators, um, but that they eventually became super predators themselves that we evolved to throw things, we evolved to run, we evolved to stand upright, we evolved to wade out into streams and tide pools and collect 
fish and crustaceans and eat them and that we hunted mammoths and mastodons and cave bears and three-toed sloths and um, really the planet is healthier with these animals on it and uh, we are healthier when we eat them and uh, if anything I would like people to know that you know hell, eating a, a meat-based diet might very well be the way that they're healthiest and they feel best and this really my mission is about quality of life and I don't want people to be afraid to eat meat I don't want them to think that they're doing something wrong because they're doing something that's entirely natural this is a little drawing I was working on with uh, my cohorts and autistic carnivores. This needs some updating, but uh, this is sort of a way of mapping out symptomology. So I just kind of threw this in there. It, it, people have already given me some ideas on how to improve it. I'm working on a flow chart. Um, Hopefully in the future videos, we'll be able to develop some uh, diagrams like this to sort of demonstrate the uh, concepts a little better. I threw this one in there because uh, Tucker Goodrich is the fellow pictured here. He's being interviewed by Ivor Cummings, the fat emperor. Ivor Cummings' mission is to uh, get people to get a calcium, coronary uh, calcium heart score. So people know whether they have blockage of their arteries or not. And Tucker Goodrich here, uh, he talks about seed oils, which are commonly known as vegetable oils. And I like to bring this up because um, I think seed oils are probably contributing to um, the decline in health and quite possibly autism, just like carbohydrates are, when we, our sugars are. And I think it's an interesting time because one of the big arguments that Tucker will make is he thinks seed oils or vegetable oils are even more damaging than excessive carbohydrates, or refined carbohydrates. So this is actually a screenshot from a YouTube video if you want to watch it. You could just look for the Fat Emperor, Ivor Cummings, or Tucker Goodrich. And uh, you can learn more. Tucker's done a number of uh, interviews. And Ivor Cummings interviews people. I don't know how many he's done, but you know, maybe 100 by now. And they're very informative. So this is a book. Sorry, the pictures are much smaller than I thought it would be. It says How to End the Autism Epidemic. And this is by J.B. Handley. This is one of the books I recommend people um, read. It's probably more on the side of, hey, what's going on when people take their, their young child to get their vaccinations and all of a sudden they suddenly change? You know, why, why did my kids start, you know, have convulsions and why did their vocabulary disappear? You know, why is everybody telling me that vaccines don't cause autism? And again, I think the obvious answer is, is that the vaccines aren't actually causing the autism they're triggering immune activation. The immune activation is making the autistic symptoms much worse. And these symptoms could be made worse by immune activation, chronic inflammation in the brain, chronic inflammation in the digestive tract. If you don't think that's the digestive tract is, is so well related, you gotta remember that 75% of your serotonin is manufactured in your digestive tract. And Take a wild guess how many people are on serotonin reuptake inhibitors. A lot of autistic people have terrible digestive issues, and that's a number, another reason why a lot of uh, autistic people are graduate to like a ketogenic diet or even a carnivore diet because their digestion gets so much better and their mind gets so much clearer. Their depression gets so much better. Their anxiety goes gets so much lower. They're more social. So that's really the mission of my videos, is to kind of bring these ideas out and let people know that that just changing your diet might might make a huge difference. And there's lots of people out there struggling with this. And more so now, more and more adult autistic people like myself are are dealing with this. And we find a great deal of relief in just changing our diet.
This is uh, another book. This is by, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah Peter. But sometimes I accidentally call him Timothy, and I don't know why. But Peter J. Hotez, MD, PhD, vaccines did not cause Rachel's autism. Now, uh, Dr. Hotez is a vaccine re researcher. He develops vaccines. He makes a very strong case for vaccines not actually causing um, autism. And I think he's got a point, but I think he also misses the point that uh, the vaccines aren't necessarily causing the autism, but some of the vaccines might actually be triggering very strong autistic symptoms through immune activation. There's a great uh, Joe Rogan podcast with uh, Peter Hotez. I, I recommend you, you read his book, just like J.B. Handley's book. And uh, I, I recommend you, you uh, watch the interview with Joe Rogan. It's very informative. I think everybody on, everybody on either side of the argument, or everybody who cares about the autism they might have or someone they know has or somebody they work with has, should really uh, inform themselves. Um, I, I recall uh, Dr. Hotez making the point that, you know, little kids are assaulted with, you know, bacteria and um, viruses all the time. So why, you know, giving them a, why should a vaccine make a difference? Well, you know, first of all, the, the diseases that we vaccinate against are the most dangerous diseases. And secondly, the, the vaccines are designed to elicit a reaction from the immune system, right? They're typically injected. They could be, they could be, uh, you know, they could be drops in the nose or they could be, you know, given orally or whatever, but typically they're injected and they're injected with adjuvants typically. And the adjuvants too are, are, are chemicals that are added to elicit an immune reaction. So, you know, typically, you know, little kids, you know, are exposed to germs, but they're not injected into the kids with an adjuvant. So that in itself, that stimulating reaction or that immune activation could be the trigger for the symptomology. And so I'm an advocate of just reviewing vaccines. I think some of them probably need to be upgraded. Some of them maybe aren't as safe as we thought they were. And clearly when you read about them, a lot of them aren't as effective as we thought they were. They don't last as long. So I think that that whole sort of concept needs to be updated. This one is Neurotribes. This is a kind of a look back at the origins of autistic diagnosis and some of the famous autistics throughout history and stuff like that. It's a, it's a very interesting book. Um, I, I like the book. I think people should read it. I think it had an unintended side effect uh, where a lot of, especially high functioning autistic people were like, Oh, see, like autism is a good thing. It's, you know, I don't want to be cured. I don't want to be fixed. I'm better than other people the way I am. So, you know, how dare you suggest that anything about autism needs to be corrected and I've seen that a number of times, and it's disturbing because I also know kids and families that struggle with people who are severely autistic, who are uh, profoundly unhappy and depressed, who are profoundly challenged by everyday life. And it hasn't, you know, nobody wants that. I mean, we still love those people, and, you know, a lot of families have an amazing amount of dedication to take care of those people. And still, a lot of those people have to be institutionalized, they have to be medicated, and they really struggle. Suicide rates are very high among autistic people. Unemployment is very high among autistic people. Poverty and despair is very high among autistic people. So as much as there's been a lot of famous people who discovered things, um, people that were remarkable who were autistic, uh, I don't think that's really a reason to not want to know what's going on and maybe prevent autism or at least reduce the severity of autism. And like I said, my, my cause is really to improve the quality of life for everybody. So 
Anyways, I'm back to the beginning of my slides. I am really towards the end of my video here. It's probably a little longer than I would it, uh, liked it to be, but uh, I appreciate you watching. I appreciate any support I get. Appreciate new subscribers. I appreciate people sharing the um, the links to the videos, and uh, I appreciate people looking up the studies and reading the books and uh, having a discussion about it. So feel free to leave comments, please share, please subscribe. And again, thank you for watching and I hope this helps somebody out there. I hope everybody feels better.